Well, good morning and welcome to Calvary Baptist Church. I'm excited to have so many people here with us this morning. I want to draw your attention to just a few things before we launch into our service. First of which is if you got a bulletin on your way in, there's uh, something rather important, I would say, inside that. Uh, several things, in fact. And we're going to talk to you, I want to talk to you about just a couple of them. First of which... We have these uh, life group signups going on right now. This is a fantastic way to get involved and to interact with other people, to get to know people. If you're wondering about some of the stuff of what the church is like, trying to find people to connect with, these are a great option. Um, if you fill out your, your name and your email address on the front of that and uh, select up to three choices of the different classes that are there, uh, it is a great time to, to interact with people. Um, and there are a few groups that I wanted to highlight uh, today, uh, some of the ones that have the uh, the most availability still uh, still available. <laughs> there's still mo enough room in there for everyone to jump into. Um, there's still room for pretty much anyone in any class, but uh, I did want to draw attention to uh, our women's group hosted by, facilitated by Michelle Watts. Um, they're talking about how to break through the busyness and distractions and find a meaningful life in Christ refueling your passion for God, finding healing from the past wounds and freedom from guilt, and focusing on relationships. I know that uh, those are things that are, are important for our, our people today, our society, and if you have the ability to set aside some time on Sunday afternoons, I know they would love to have you. Um, the next group I wanted to highlight is another ladies group. This is facilitated by uh, Stephanie Weck and Heather Armstrong. This is going to be on Fridays. And uh, they are exploring a biblical perspective on how to find strength when wrestling between faith and feelings and to trust God and his goodness through uncertainty in those times, even when life doesn't turn out how you hoped it would. Um, such uh, encouragement is needed in our, t in, our, in our day and age. And then the last one, and I think by far this is probably the best study, and I can't believe it's not filled out yet, is uh, my own study. Um, <laughs> It's called Tales of the Kingdom, and it is, in fact, a storybook, and it, uh, uh, it, it explores some very timeless truths that are set to, to new parables, and we're hoping that these allegories will help us to gain new perspective on the riches that we have in Christ and how God loves us, and uh, that's also going to be meeting on Fridays, but uh, again, there are room in any of the groups, and I would highly encourage you to uh, to look through those and see which one you can commit to. There are some different, uh, some of these meet weekly, some meet every other week. Um, and if you're curious about it, if you think you might want to try something out, sign up, uh, get the information. There's no harm in that. Uh, we'd love to see those, uh, those groups fill up. And uh, those are actually starting uh, this week. So uh, now is the time to, to get in on those. Uh, second thing I wanted to bring up is what's going on tonight. We are going to be showing the, the movie Overcomer here. Guys, do we have that, uh, that trailer queued up and ready to go? If you haven't seen the movie, this is a little bit about what it's about. This is an excellent still shot from <laughs> the movie. <laughs> Let me just tell you a little bit about it. <laughs> um, it is going to be a, an encouraging night. It is full of uh, heart and faith, and that is going to be happening tonight at 6 o'clock. Um, we do have, like, little handout tickets there, but those are more invitations than tickets. You do not need uh, a ticket in order to get in tonight. This is going to be free for everyone. Uh, and it's going to be a time for us just to, to meet together, to watch this movie, to be encouraged. And uh, I hope you will make a, uh, a note to be here for that. It, um, as a result of showing that movie tonight, though, we are adjusting the, uh, the meeting for our Thrive Student Ministry. That normally happens at 6.30. We're going to bump it up to 4.30 uh, for tonight. So if, uh, if you're between the grades of 7 to 12, um, we'd love to have you here at 4.30. We're going to be doing some, some sandwiches for dinner and, uh, and having our normal meeting. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to, to bring up from the bulletin, there's a few more things in there than this, but uh, the last one I want to highlight from here is our YMCA takeover night. We are going to be uh, meeting down at the Y on March 15th. That's coming up here in just a couple of weeks. And uh, we're going to uh, enjoy some, some food together uh, and have the, the run of their facility there. 
and uh, we're looking forward to uh, getting just to, to hang out and fellowship together that way, and I think it'll be a very good thing. And if you're thinking about coming, I'd love for you to go ahead and sign up your, your name next on the bulletin board next to the restrooms down the hall. Uh, that'll help us plan for food. It is a free event, but we want to make sure we have enough food for everyone. Um, so that is, uh, is uh, going to be helpful for us if you can do that. If not, show up anyway. We'd love to have you. Um, with that being said, that wraps up the, uh, the announcements for this morning. I'd love for you guys to go ahead and stand and join us. We're gonna, we, we are celebrating this morning the fact that we have a bunch of people who want to join this church. And uh, in honor of that, we're going to take some time this morning and remember uh, the grace that we've all been given, the grace that we have in Christ. is just absolutely amazing is the fact that what we're doing today, the thing that we're celebrating has been done for ages. Let me read to you from, from Acts 2. This is back when the, the Church of Christ just first started. 
said they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, even selling their possessions and goods, and they gave to everyone as they had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Guys, it's been over 2,000 years since that happened, and we are still doing that. God is an amazing person, and he is continuing to be at work in our world despite the the, the wrong and the sin that keeps running forth and affecting other people. He is still in the business of saving people. We're going to continue that, that theme this morning as we talk about how he's mighty to save.
final thing that I have to say here for, for a quick minute here is uh, my name is Pastor Jason. I want to officially welcome you to our service. And in the back of the seats in front of you, there are these little cards there. These are our, our connection cards, and we would love the chance to get to know you, get to hear that you were here this morning. If you could fill that out and turn it into that welcome table that's straight out these back doors. We do have a sweet treat there for you. Uh, it's just our way of saying welcome. We're glad you're here. Um, and uh, there are also a few lines on there. If you have any feedback about the service, have any prayer requests, you are more than welcome to fill that out. I know uh, myself and Pastor Joel and the rest of the leadership team here at Calvary take time each week to pray over those cards. Um, so if you have a, a something that you'd like to share with us, we'd love to get the chance to do that. For now, though, one of the things that we value here at, at Calvary is getting a chance to uh, make sure that you know that you belong here. So we're going to take just a couple of minutes, and uh, I, I want to ask you to turn and shake hands with the people around you and let them know that they're glad that you're here this morning. Good morning, Calvary. You got me on sound? How are we doing? Check, check. One, two, check, check. Check, one, two, check, check. One, two, one, two, check. Anything? Check, check. Thank you, maybe. Check, check. One, two. Check, check. Good morning. There we are. Good morning, Calvary. How are you guys doing? My goodness, what a rambunctious group this morning. How are you guys doing this morning? I bet you guys could be doing that for the next few hours if we let you. So that's great. And it's good to see you all this morning. Beautiful day outside. We're going to start right up. So, if you have your Bibles, uh, I know many of you are probably familiar with uh, the most well-known verse in all of history, John 3.16. If you have your Bibles, I want to ask if you could turn to 1 John 3.16. Uh, so you can go ahead and turn there now. And uh, this passage actually is somewhat similar to John 3.16 in that it talks about the greatest act of love ever, how God gave his son. Jesus would give up his life so that if we would believe in him, we could have life. And that is love. That is the greatest love that there is. And where we're going to be looking this morning as we uh, continue forward in 1 John is if we've received this kind of love through what Jesus has done for us, 
then that should then spur us on to love other people as well. So today, this is our last message in this series about love. We've been taking a very specific angle, and we've been talking about the little ways that we can love each other. Simple, basic, what should be easy ways that we should love one another, but they're really not that easy. And uh, I hope that you found these messages challenging. Um, This message today is especially going to be challenging for for me as well, and what we're going to be talking about. But if we don't give attention to these little ways that we can love each other, here's the problem, and I like this phrase, there is a loss of potential. If we don't focus on loving each other in these little, simple, easy, basic ways, there is tremendous potential lost in how we could have loved each other. There's so much potential here in how we can love each other more in Christ Jesus. It's kind of like a roller coaster. Now, uh, I still like thrill rides, most of them. Um, Not the spinny ones as much as I'm getting older. I'm finding the spinny rides, my head starts hurting, and my stomach doesn't like them quite as much either. But I like roller coasters. And when you go on a roller coaster, most of them, you still go up the hill. They still do that thing. You go up this hill. And when you're going up the hill, you know you're building potential. They they actually call that potential energy. And when you come over the top of that hill, the higher up the hill you've gone is the faster you're going to come down that hill. And you, you have a fun, exciting ride. Now, here's the problem. Let's say you get up toward the top of the hill and the roller coaster breaks and you're just sitting there stuck in this car for, I don't know, one hour, two hours or so, and they can't get the thing going, and then they have to extract you from the vehicle. You know, maybe you've got to walk down that long flight of steps. That's not fun. That's not exciting. But what's, what else is the problem is you've just lost all that potential. All that potential you've built up going up that hill, you'll never get to realize it and enjoy that ride. I think it's the same with our love. I think there's a lot of times we desire to love other people, We talk about how we can love other people. We make promises about how we can love other people. And a lot of times, that's where we stop. And the potential gets lost because we don't actually follow through or carry through with what we've said. And that's really what we're going to be focusing on this morning. And that is so, so difficult. This is is a frustrating message for me because this is one for me. It sounds so simple. should be easy for me to love people in that way, but it's just not. So I hope this will be challenging for you as well this morning. If you have your Bibles open, then let's look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, as we're reading here together. John says, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Well, this isn't even fair how John starts off here. Here he goes again, and he's comparing us to Jesus. And how do you do that? Because it just seems like there's such a chasm of difference between us and our Savior. You know, Jesus is perfect. He is love. He doesn't just love people in certain ways. He's the definition of love. Jesus is good in everything he does. He's always right. He's always righteous. And we're not. But there's this other way that Jesus, I think, is is set apart from us, and it's this. Jesus never seems to struggle with doing what he says. When Jesus says he's going to do something... He does it. He always follows through with his words, even to death on a cross. Now, you could read his story in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, part of the book of Acts. You read his story and when he was here on this earth and and interacting with people as a God-man. And I think, it doesn't matter who you are. You could be someone you don't like Jesus. You could be someone you don't believe in Jesus. I think anyone who reads that story If they see what's written there in God's word, they cannot, in all honesty, say Jesus was all talk. Nobody can say that when you read the story of Jesus Christ in Scripture. He always followed through with what he said. So John's kind of setting us up here. He starts out, before he's even going to tell us the simple way in how we can love each other, he points us to the example of the Savior, and he says, listen, if you follow Jesus, if you've been saved, If you're a Christian, if you're going through the process of sanctification right now, what that means is that if every day Jesus is changing you to be more and more like him, then your love should start to look more like his love as well. And if we're following Christ, we shouldn't be people who are all talk either. 
We shouldn't be people that just say how we want to love others. We should actually do it in the same way that Jesus does. So that's where Paul, or Paul, where John says here, in the way that Jesus has laid down his life, we should lay down our life for others. Now again, how do you, how do you compare that? How can you even say that? Jesus is the only one who can go to the cross, who could shed blood, who could be the substitution for all humanity as a sacrifice so that anyone who would believe in him can receive eternal life. Only Jesus can do that. I can't do that. You can't do that. So what is John going on about here saying we should lay down our life in the same way that Jesus did? Now, John is going to shift gears. He does something very interesting, and it's actually a little bit of a play on words that you won't catch in the English language. Here's how he shifts gears. He says, the way we can lay down our lives for others, verse 17, if anyone has material possessions, that's an interesting place that that John just went to, that's a switch of gears, and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? So here you have John saying, Jesus laid down his life. That word life is the Greek word suke. And this word life means your whole person, your whole self, your soul, everything that you are. Jesus laid down all of who he was for us. Then John says, we should lay down our suke, everything that we are. And then he starts talking about material possessions and goods. Like that's such a strange place that John goes to. However, there's more here than meets the eye. The original words here in the Greek, it doesn't, it's not possessions. There's no word for possessions or goods. The original words here in the Greek is cosmos bios, meaning world. And then the word bios is actually another word for life. He's saying world life. And what does that mean? This word bios has to do with anything, activities or anything of this earth that can sustain, promote, encourage someone else's well-being and life, okay? So it could be more than worldly possessions. It could be more than goods. It could be energy that's given. It could be service that's given, anything of this world. We have been blessed with so much. Every one of us has so much, not just goods and possessions, but time and energy. God has given us so much. And what John is saying here is if we've accepted the love of Jesus Christ and how he's poured out his blood on the cross, then how can we possibly withhold the things of this world and how we can love other people? And John is saying, in loving people that way, that is Christ-like love. And that's how we should love one another. Very interesting, but I wanted to point this out here. This is context, and the principle that we're going to be looking at is what we're going to be reading next. We're going to come to this very soon, which is verse 18. Let's continue on there. John says, Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. So again, for context here, I actually want to start with verse 20. Because here is the problem. He says, whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. The problem is, our hearts and how we feel sometimes is not in tune with the truth. Does that make sense? Any of you ever have that problem? Sometimes how you feel about things, sometimes your perception of things, often which is being filtered through your emotions, is just not in line with what is true. And the problem is sometimes we can examine ourselves. We ask ourselves, how have I been doing? Have I been loving? Have I been obedient? And we can examine ourselves And we can self-incriminate ourselves and we can doubt ourselves and we can condemn ourselves. I'm one of the worst when it comes to this. I am very, very hard on myself. There's so many times that I've just felt like an absolute failure. There's so many times where I felt like I've totally missed the mark. 
And John's words here are just so encouraging and helpful if that's you too. If you're one of those people, if you're like me, you're hard on yourself, you just, you're just wondering, can I ever be a loving enough person? John's words are so encouraging and helpful. But we have to be careful in how we interpret them. Because in understanding these words from verse 20, there's a really fine line, and you're going to stand on one of two sides of this fine line. Either you'll stand on this side and and catch the wrong thing. You won't get it. You'll miss what John is saying, and it can really mislead you. Or you can stand on the other side of this line, and you'll get it. You'll understand his words, and it'll be very helpful and encouraging. So let me start with what I think John is not saying here. I do not believe that John is telling you this, these words in verse 20, to help remedy your feelings in the times when you're wrong and misjudging your love toward others. In other words, when your heart is wrong, when your emotions are wrong, John is not trying to hold out some hope for you that you can believe, oh, I can fix that. I can get my heart in line with what is true. I don't believe that's actually what he's saying here. And that's actually a losing battle. That's an impossible battle, I think. And there's two reasons for that. Number one, do you agree with this? Sometimes our emotions are so out of whack. We can be so angry, so upset, so bitter, that we're just not gonna listen to reason. Logic won't work. And it's very difficult for us to accept what's truth. That doesn't mean that God can't speak in a way that he would overcome that, but I think there are times where people come into our life and they try and speak truth to us, but our emotions are like a wall, and we just won't even let logic through or reason through. And the second thing is, sometimes we just can't know what's truth. God knows everything. And there are some things that he knows that are hidden from us and that he chooses not to reveal to us. So here's what I do believe that John is saying by these encouraging words from verse 20. John is saying you can't rely on yourself. You can't know by yourself, have you been faithful? Have you been loving? The only thing you can and should do is trust God with that because he is the judge. God is the ultimate judge, not just of others, but of you as well. God is the ultimate judge of your own heart. God, you need to believe this. God knows your own heart better than you do. He is the ultimate judge. John is telling you this because he wants you to not rely on your self-approval in meeting self-imposed expectations where you say, If I do this, if I reach this standard, then I'm a loving enough person, I'm an obedient person. No, 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 not at all. Instead, trust in God who knows the truth of your obedience as you love others. So if that's you, if you feel like a failure today, if you're feeling like you can never be loving enough, your emotions might be so intense, it's actually preventing you from loving well because of how you feel about yourself. John is saying, maybe you're wrong. Maybe those feelings you have about yourself, maybe you're wrong. Take that pressure off yourself and instead just trust in God because he knows the score. Because what is loving other people really about anyway? We love others, why? Because we want to do what? We want to please God, don't we? Isn't that what loving other people is all about? Loving other people isn't about me meeting my own standard and get my own self-approval. So I would just encourage you, just keep on loving. Just keep on trusting. Now we come to these two verses, verse 18 and 19. This is where I really want to focus in. This is where we find, I think, a very simple principle, important principle for love. Look at verse 18. Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. Jesus is not a person who is all talk. We shouldn't be either. Here's the simple statement. You need to do what you say. When it comes to loving other people, 
when you have these, these ideas of how you can love other people, when you say these statements of maybe how you can love someone else, when you make these promises, you need to do it. You need to do it. We need to do what we say, as long as it's good and right. So if you're thinking, like, I'm going to go blow somebody's car up or something, no, don't do that. If it's good, if it's right, if God has put something on your heart and how you can love another person, and let's say you're, you know, I really, I really should. We've got to start turning our shoulds into wills. I really should write that person a card. That person's struggling right now. That person's just lost a love. I should, I should write that person a card. That's got to become a will. I will write that person a card. And then do it. Follow through. We should invite that family over. Oh, we've been talking about it for months. We should just invite that family. You know what's going to happen? Several more months are going to go by. It's got to become, we will invite that family over. Let's go talk to them today. And then do it. There's all these should statements that we make, and here's what we have to do is we have to commit ourselves to that statement. I should bless this person. I should give this person a little gift. I should do this kind act. No, just make it a will statement. I will bless that person and do it. At some point, guys, we have got to stop talking about love, and we've got to just do it. We've just got to do it. And this, honestly, this sounds so simple. This is one of my hardest hurdles. I struggle with this so much, and it's so frustrating because I constantly have thoughts of little ways I can love people, but I struggle with doing them. And it's only when I get serious and I commit to it, and it becomes a will statement, and I ask for God's help. God, help me follow through with this desire you've put on my heart and how I can love someone. That's where the talk becomes action. And that's what we need to do as believers as well. It's one of the reasons I'm excited about baptism and membership this morning. Because in January, there was an invitation given. We asked for people who want to get baptized or join the church to come forward, and and they signed up. And there were two people that came forward for baptism. And then there were 12 more that came forward for membership. And what's so neat about that is these were people that turned should statements into will statements. They sensed God putting something on their heart that says, go forward, be baptized, join this church. And they didn't sit in their chair saying, I should really do that, I should really do it. No, I think through prayer it became, I will do it, I'm gonna do it. And then they got up out of their chair and they put one foot in front of the other and here they were at the front signing up. And today, they're gonna be joining our church family. And that's exciting. Now that's loving. Now, who are they loving? It's God. You realize obedience, so many times in Scripture, the Bible ties together obedience to God as a way that we love Him. This is a way they were loving God, this passion that they had for Him, this desire He put on their heart, they followed through with it. Not just in obedience, but also in love for Him. They turned talk into action, and we need to do the same thing. Now, I actually want to kind of piggyback on this and bring up a second point, very similar. Go back to verse 18, because I want you to see how it says here that we shouldn't love with words or tongue. I would think, I believe what it's saying there is empty words, empty promises. Because sometimes the actions that we need to commit in the life of other people that is loving must be accompanied by words. Words must be intertwined with that action. Words are powerful. Do you believe that? You believe there's power in words? Very powerful. But the potential is lost. There's no power if those words aren't spoken. Now, I saw this one joke floating around online, and I was wondering when to say it. Maybe today's the day, I don't know. But it's about Billy Graham. And uh, Billy Graham had just gotten back from one of his crusades, and he ends up at the airport. There's this limousine that's there to pick him up, to take him to his house. And so Billy Graham says to the limo driver, he says, you know what? I've done a lot of things in my life. I'm over 70 years old, but something I've never gotten to do is to drive a limo. So he asks the limo driver, he says, can I drive your limo? And the driver's like, you're Billy Graham. You want to drive my limo? You go drive my limo. 
So Billy Graham gets in, and, and he just takes off. I mean, he is driving way too fast, probably like 70 miles per hour in a 50-mile-per-hour zone. And sure enough, he passes a police officer, and he gets pulled over. So the police officer gets out of his car and walks up to the limousine, looks inside, turns around, and he walks right back to his car. It was a little strange. Gets on the radio, and he says, uh, sir, he's talking to the sheriff. He says, I know you've told me that we should never make exceptions. We need to give tickets to everybody, but I think today we should make an exception. So the sheriff says, well, who is in this car that we're not going to give him a ticket? Is it the governor? And he says, no, I, I think it's somebody a little bit more important than the governor. He says, well, who's in the car? Is it the president of the United States? He says, no, actually, I think it's somebody even more important than the president. Then there's some silence on the radio, and, and the sheriff says, well, then who is in that car? And the officer says, well, I think it's Jesus because he's got Billy Graham as the chauffeur. There is tremendous potential in a joke so that people can laugh, as long as the joke is good. Some of them not so much. But how will people laugh if the joke is never spoken? There is tremendous potential in words of encouragement that can lift someone up and bring healing. But how will someone ever feel that if a person doesn't say those words? There is power in the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is power to save But even in the book of Romans, it says, how will people hear if there isn't a preacher and those words aren't spoken? There are words that we just need to speak. Powerful. James 3.9 tells us about the extreme power of our words. Two opposite ends, actually. James chapter 3, verse 9, it says, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father and with it we curse men. We've been made in God's likeness out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. Two total opposite extremes here. And here is part of where I get so frustrated with myself because do you know the words that are usually most appealing to me? The words in my flesh, I think, that I want to say? It's those words that are negative, harmful, sarcastic, mean, and cutting. Those are the words that are the most appealing to me. And James doesn't sugarcoat how damaging those words could be, how horrible some of these words can be. In that same chapter, verse 3, 5 and 6, he says, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great fire or forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. I don't want to speak words like that, but there's times I do. And it's, it's so disappointing, especially as I catch myself. Times I'm angry, times I'm bitter, times I'm upset. But it's the other words, those words that are kind and loving and encouraging and complimentary. Those are the words that seem to take effort. Those are the words that can be hard to say. And I see it with my children all the time. Now, this is no surprise. I've got a boy and a girl, a typical brother and sister. This is not going to surprise you. They get on each other's nerves. If you've grown up with siblings, you know what I'm talking about. If you're a parent of siblings, you know what I'm talking about. They get on each other's nerves. And what's so interesting is for them to say harmful words or even to make harmful contact, physical contact, pushing, whatever, it seems to happen all so naturally. It's like easy for them. But we have this rule in our home, and it's this. As part of the apology and making amends, and this is as long as they're not too angry at the time because this won't work right, but part of the, the apology is If you say harmful words, then you need to say kind and loving words. If you've given a harmful touch, then you need to give a loving touch. And so the easy way that we usually try and implement this is we will ask our kids to give each other a hug 
if something happens, that's the loving touch. And to say, I'm sorry, those are the loving words. Now, some of you as parents, you know exactly where this is going. You've seen what happens next after the argument. The next few minutes are so awkward, like they'll give each other this kind of side hug. They really don't want to do that, right? And, and they'll mumble, I'm, I'm sorry. And it takes a couple times before there's some genuineness to it, before they mean it. And, and okay, I'm really sorry. And they give each other a hug and I love you, Abby. I love you, Eli. Now, don't get me wrong. I love my kids. I thank God every day for the kids that I have. They're awesome. But you know what? My kids struggle with the same thing that I struggle with and the same thing that you struggle with as human beings in the flesh. And it's those words that are so good, that are so right, that are so loving. Those are the words that we can struggle with saying. But those are the words that need to be said. Now, I want to give you one more example, and it's this. And this is something God has recently been putting on my heart that that I've got to do better with myself. But guys, when we say we're going to pray for somebody, we need to do it. We need to follow through with that. Can I preach on this for a little bit? Can I get my soapbox out? Because I need to do that here. We have got to follow through with those words. When we say we're going to pray for someone, because there is power in prayer. There is not power in the promise of prayer. Praying for someone and saying you're going to pray for someone are not the same thing. And you've got to be careful because there's temptation in that. And you might be tempted to say, oh, let's just cop out of that whole thing. Maybe we just shouldn't tell people we're going to pray for them at all. And, and that's not the right thing to do. We should tell people we're going to pray for them. And here's what I would encourage you. In this day and age, there is absolutely no excuse that we can't remember that we said we're going to pray for that person. Let me, let me show you something that can help you. This thing right here, okay? There's some things about this that are not so great. But there's some things about this that, that are really good. Here's something that, that I've been trying to work on. It kind of goes like this. Email Joel Weck. What's the subject of your email? Pray for Billy Bob Joe Smith. What would you like your email to say? Pray for him before bedtime. Here's your message to Joel Weck. Ready to send it? Send. Now, you know what's going to happen next time I open up my email? Maybe, I don't know, 10 minutes later or so, 20 minutes later, later on at some point, I'm going to see that email, and it's going to be, that's right, I need to pray for that person. You know, we live in a day and age, it's not just series. We've got Alexas that are helping us out. We've got Googles that are helping us out. Not just calendars, but we've got, or, or not just the emails, we've got calendars. We can set timers. We can give ourselves notifications. All these ways that we can remind ourselves to pray for others, and we need to do that. Because prayer is not just words, it is action Two, the Bible says in James 5, 16, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. We need to do that. 1 Timothy 2, 1, I urge then first of all that requests, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for what? Everyone. Not just people in the church and where he'll continue on there is also rulers and kings like the president and people who are in power. Everybody, we should be praying for them. Say it and do it. Now, at this time, what I'd like to do is I'm going to invite our two baptism candidates that are going to be getting baptized. You can head back behind this door. I want to invite the worship team up as well. And I just want to ask if you can imagine, what would it look like if we carried through with our desire to pray for people? Imagine how different it would be if every single person who is involved with Calvary Baptist Church would lift up holy hands, would get down on their knees, would pray for their pastors, would pray for the church leaders, would pray for each other. You would pray for each other as brothers and sisters. You would pray for those who are hurting. If we even just did that, imagine how different things would be here in this church. Imagine how different things would be in our families, in our homes if we did that. Can you imagine what it'd be like if we constantly 
bathed each other in prayer. Amen. Amen. And not gossip about each other behind our backs. And not say words of slander. But to lift each other up in prayer. Imagine what that would be like. You see, folks, I am just not convinced that our greatest strides to becoming a more loving church and more loving families in our homes is found in the gigantic acts of love, is found in these enormous words of love. I believe our greatest strides to becoming more loving, it's in the little things. Things like thinking about each other, putting yourself in another person's shoes. How would that person feel most loved? Last week we talked about using your spiritual gift. If God has given you a gift, use it. That is a love language in itself. Serve in that way. That is loving. And then today, to say what we want to say, to do what we say, these little things, they make all the difference. Pastor Jason, would you lead us in a time of prayer at this time? God, we thank you for the fact that you do not leave us just to wonder and to walk around this world trying to figure it out. And we thank you for the fact that your word gives us such great instruction. I'd ask that you would help us to, to think on it, to take it to heart. God, I am excited for the fact that you've brought 14 people here uh, who want to be a part of this mission, who want to be a part of, of this church. God, I, I, I'm excited for that, but I also ask that you would put a fire in our hearts that we would desire to see more. God, I pray for this, this congregation here, myself included in that, that you would help us to, to seek out ways that we can put your love into practice so that, uh, so that people may know you and they know your word. God, we uh, are thankful for um, all that you're doing here, and it's in your precious name I pray. Amen. Right now, so I want to. Oh, there I am. I'm going to be baptizing two people right now. So I first want to invite, if you can please welcome Kenneth Glenn. All right. And here's Ken's testimony I didn't know a whole lot about God or church when I was young. The only time I ever went to church was when I was visiting my dad in North Carolina. I saw that he had a lot of passion for God, but I couldn't understand it. I used to think that going to church would be a waste of a weekend, and I could be doing many more fun things than that. When I went to public school, I ended up becoming friends with others that were not good role models. Before I met them, I had always tried to be the good kid and to not get in trouble. But it wasn't long before I started gaining some of their habits. I started getting trouble at school and getting bad grades. I started swearing, getting into fights, and becoming selfish. At that time, my stepdad, uh, Tom, also struggled with an addiction, and it made me angry. But it was at this time that change started to happen in my life. Tom overcame this addiction and started going to church. I tried going to church with him, but it was boring. And I told him it just wasn't for me. Tom insisted that we try another church, and so we came here to Calvary, and it was on August 2nd, 2017. That was the same day that the carpets were changed, if anyone's wondering. And shortly after, I started going to youth group. And it was later that year, on November 17th, I went to Reverb, and that's where I got saved. Ever since then, I have wanted to live my best for the Lord, but I know I'm not perfect. Even Romans 3.10 reminds me that there is none righteous, not even one. I want you to know that this young man, shortly after he's been saved, has already shared the gospel with another young person, and it was right here at Valley Heights Christian Academy, and that person came to know the Lord as well. So it is so awesome when we see not only someone who comes to Christ, but they begin to share the gospel, and then Jesus just continues to save. Let me go over this way. So Ken, let me ask you, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. And is it your desire to follow him through the waters of believer's baptism and live for him all the days of your life? Yes. 
then based on your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is her testimony. I grew up in a Christian home. My father constantly instilled religious values and a Christian lifestyle in me. Although I cannot tell you exactly when I was saved, I would guess it was between four and eight years old. I was raised in Calvary Baptist Church of Norwich and remember coming here to Sunday school, church services, Awana, and youth group every week. And I attended Camp Bayuka every summer. I also remember going on a missions trip to Costa Rica when I was a teen. This was my steady church for the first 18 years of my life. Although as a child, there were many times at that time in my life when I would be on the way home from church second-guessing if Jesus really saved me, it was really when I was around 12 years old that I realized he definitely did. I know I am saved. I am confident in my Christian beliefs, and I can feel that. So Stephanie, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yeah. And is it your desire to follow him through the waters of believer's baptism and live for him all the days of your life? Yes. Then based on your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.
Sliding on down this way just a little bit. We'll get everybody across the front there. Okay. Good looking bunch, huh? <laughs> we the deacons of Calvary Baptist Church recommend the following people by their testimonies and continues to baptize as believers by immersion to be received into membership of Calvary Baptist Church of Norwich. By baptism, Kenneth Gwynn and Stephanie. By letter of transfer, Jody Eckert, Lisa Kelly, Cindy Miracle, Solomon Miracle, Elaine Regan Shagan. <laughs> I wish you did. I did practice it before I came up. <laughs> By Christian experience, having previously been baptized, Annika Armstrong, Jonah Belts, Shannon Belts, I don't know how those two got it, Crystal Ernest, Cindy Scott, Ed Wright, Melinda White, Melinda Wright. Will all those who are currently members of Calvary Baptist Church of Norwich and are in favor of receiving these candidates into membership, please stand. Okay. Let the church clerk record that on this day, all the above names mentioned were given the right hand of fellowship. I like the standing. I don't like doing eyes and nays because we're voting on people, and there's nothing that says welcome to Calvary Baptist Church other than some nays. So if you ever know of something, and I got to go hunt somebody down, you come see me. But standing is a great way to vote. It's right on the same level we just see by majority. So we're so excited you guys are here. So I just want to welcome you all officially. So welcome. Jonah, welcome. Shannon, welcome. And... Jody is not here with us today. She is sick. She has the flu. But she would have been here, and she did go through all the classes and everything, so we also want to be welcoming Jody. Crystal, welcome. Ken, That's welcome. Me. And congratulations. Lisa, welcome. Stephanie, welcome and congratulations. Solomon, welcome. Cindy, welcome. Eileen 
What is what was it again? Shimin Shaman? I don't know. It's not that, but welcome. Reagan? Cindy, welcome. Ed, welcome. Welcome And oh, Joe, oh, you have hers as well. They're stuck together. And Melinda, welcome. So let's give the Lord one more praise. Amen. We're going to finish this thing off by giving glory back to God in song and also by taking up our offering. So just make sure that you get to talk to these guys at some point. Congratulate them. Welcome them. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. And kids, and kids from junior church are in the back of the church, so parents, make sure you claim your kids. Don't, don't go over looking for them. They're here. So worship team, if you can lead us in our final song. As Pastor mentioned, we've got one more final song, but uh, we also want to take time and, and thank God for, for the things that he's given us and uh, respond uh, with our offerings this morning. Now this is not something that we do to coerce people, to make you feel like you have to do this. This is a way that we worship God. Um, we feel like he has given us so much that giving back in the form of money is just one of the ways that, uh, that we can give. Um, so if that's your heart and you want to give uh, to this church, to that mission, uh, you can feel free to do so in the plates as they go by, or you can actually do that right from your smartphone and go to cbcnorwich.com, look for the giving tab there, and you can give through uh, a check or a debit or a direct uh, withdrawal that way. Um, let's go ahead and, and pray and thank God for what he's doing. God, we praise you for uh, the fact that you are in control, the fact that you govern and guide us, and God, thank you for the blessings that you give us. Um, I heard someone say that anything short of hell is a blessing, and God, that is truly what we deserve, and yet you seek, and yet you give us life, you give us clothing, you take care of us, you give us food, um, among many other things. God, we'd ask that you would take these, these gifts as we are giving them these offerings and these tithes that, and, and use them for your glory. God, help this message of hope to, to go out to Norwich and the surrounding areas, and uh, God, we praise you for what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. We got one more song that we're going to go ahead and, and ask you to stand and join us for as, uh, as we conclude our service this morning. This is a prayer uh, that God would continue his work here in Norwich.
are so thankful that you came and were a part of our service this morning and a part of the celebration, really. Uh, I want to remind you that uh, if you have your, those life uh, group signups or your com- connection cards, please go ahead and turn those into that welcome table on your way out. Thank you again for joining us this morning. You are dismissed.